Uh, okay, here we all are. There, Jean's got her teapot. Okay. Like, are you recording that this morning? <laughs> yeah. Like right now. Yes, it's a good job. Okay. You look fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> You have to remember, Jane, this is the woman who got in front and sock puppets using a, a stranger's socks. So, that like, you know, this, that happened. I was there. Fighting mud skippers. <laughs> That's right. You were there. Oh, was there. I How stayed, cool was that? I was like, <laughs> <laughs> That's, I was like, was it Leonard Bresnev, you know, slamming his shoe in the, no, it was Khrushchev, Khrushchev, right? <laughs> slamming his shoe in the United Nations and I'm the sock puppet girl. I could do the teapot. I'm super excited because here's our Geoversity crew, uh, all our biomimicry faculty from Geoversity. It's very exciting. This is going to be our first uh, semester. And we've got Lisa Dawkin over there. And we've got Jane Toner down in Melbourne. Uh, and we have Hugo in Belgium. And Lisa's in the Catskills, and I am out here in San Diego. Uh, we're going to be talking about geoversity and the um, how we've been bringing biomimicry into it. The idea with geoversity is that here we're seeing, you know, all of our systems are in crisis all over the world, right? And so what we really need to do is get back to that biocultural renewal, which is that human um, trait uh, that allows us to adapt to what other habitat, whatever conditions happen. So now here we are in this situation where everything is, you know, really stressed and stretched. We don't have the resilience and we don't have the innovation that we once had. Um, and the, you know, the reason for that is because we've been designing for efficiency. And so, you know, as a biomimic, we all know living systems are adaptive. They grow and they learn and they heal um, and they regenerate. But we've been designing with this machine mind for so long. So here are the ideas. This Geoversity School of Biocultural Leadership is going to teach the new generation how to uh, do that, how to regenerate cultures that regenerate ecosystems that feed us all. So I'm really excited to have you guys as part of the faculty. And I'm really excited to have Hugo uh, orchestrating this effort with all his visual amazingness. Um, and it's just been really great to see all of us going through biomimicry together over the years and coming together to a point where we're really giving back. So I wanted to have each of you introduce yourselves, uh, talk a little bit about what you're working on and what you uh, see as your contribution to geoversity. What are you excited about bringing? Okay, you drink your tea. We'll let, we'll let Lisa go. Okay. Uh, my name is Lisa Dawkin. I was in the biomimicry um, B Pro and the first graduate program with Tamsin and Jane, lucky me. Um, and over the last few years, what I've been doing with, with that um, expertise is primarily teaching at Columbia at the Earth Institute and doing some workshops. And one of my new found sort of interesting loves is working with a group that some of you guys know, which is the um, Global Regenerative Collab and um, been doing lots of really interesting work with people around the world. And so it's all about bioregional regenerative development, which I think is really exciting and obviously fits perfectly with the concepts of biomimicry. Did you have your tea? I've had a bit of tea, <clears throat> but I'm still a bit um, <laughs> challenged. <laughs> <laughs> It's early morning here in Australia. I know, I know. I, um, I feel for you. Um, <laughs> and I, I'd actually like to begin by um, acknowledging the traditional owners of the land from where I'm speaking. Uh, I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And I further acknowledge that um, sovereignty of this land was uh, never ceded and it always was and always will be um, Aboriginal land. So, yeah, yeah, it has been since the, since the dream time. But yeah, one of the things that makes me really proud is uh, the renaissance in Indigenous knowledge. To me, that ties in with biomimicry. You know, in Australia, we have, you know, a very unique 
uh, ecosystem. We have a unique landscape and ancient land and, you know, the way to connect to that um, knowledge is through Indigenous knowledge. And I think that's the case with, um, you know, every everyone. So we're really lucky here in Australia. And reading um, Tyson Yunkaporta's book, Sand Talk. Yeah. And, yeah. And if any of you haven't read this, you have to read this. Have to yeah. read this. Um, and actually, this is part of our core curriculum uh, for Geoversity. It's um, Sand Talk and um, and this old rag. This one. <laughs> Not that I can compare, but it is a very interesting thing how uh, you know Indigenous cultures have spent tens of thousands of generations acquiring ways to keep the land regenerating so they can continue to feed their offspring. And here we are, we've basically cut off our limbs and stopped re you know, regenerating the cultures that feed us. In Geoversity, we have um, two main tribes there that have sovereignty, they have their own territories uh, and, and they're collaborators and allies with us. I think, I really think that's the way of the future is rediscovering the ways that we um, already know that's humans. So thank you. And I think that's really a core part of the diversity curriculum. So that's going to be great to have you there. Thank you, Jean. But I'm looking at how to integrate biomimicry into regenerative design projects and really through uh, genius of place. So regenerative design considers um, connection to place, but I think through biomimicry, we can offer a greater depth, really pushing the same barrow that I have been for a long time, or what is it, hoisting the same pouch. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, these ruse. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, I think you're going to really love working with Chris Lopez because he's, uh, he's my team partner on this. He, uh, that's his whole thing is he's working with the Regenesis Institute on the frameworks and his whole passion is for story of place um, and genius of place. And so there's a lot of room for those to come together. And to me, that's one of my main passions right now is integrating the regenerative design with the biomimicry so that we can put what we know about the evolutionary process and these, these deep principles and and translate them into actionable items, you know, in a, in an, a consistent unified theory of uh, what directs us in our endeavors. So we'll be very honored to have you there and pushing the envelope on that. So thank you. But, um, yeah, my name is Hugo Guaraujo. I'm a Mexican Colombian. I'm a biomimic professional as well. Uh, part of the, I think second generation, if I remember well, has been kind of a long time now. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, I think what I'm hearing and what I really like is this idea on indigenous people and, and the, the idea of, of the story of the place as well. So something that I realized is that is, well, I've been working in impact evaluation for more than 10 years and I work with a little bit more than 14 uh, indigenous cultures. And I think what I saw in university is that you have respect for, we have respect for the people, but also for the place. And I think one of the main mistakes that we're doing globally right now is exactly the same mistake that we did with indigenous people. Since we don't understand what they were trying to say, then we thought that they were stupid or that they were not worth it of our respect. And then we, we stole with violence and the roots. And this is the same thing that we do with the trees. And this is the same thing that we do for all the habitats of, of, of the animals and even minerals, mountains. We've been able to, to take mountains out of, of their own place and, and put it into our building. So my, my challenge, I think, was how to, how to change the narrative and how to think about it in a different way. Because when you just see it like this, it's not just depressing, but it's also almost impossible to change something. But what I found in university is that they are doing it the other way around. So by respecting the land, by respecting the place, and it didn't start just now, but really a long time ago, knowing the story of Nathan, Klaus, and meeting the people, the staff that is in there, 
you can see that there are people that have a commitment and that they, they also share values. Yeah, 30 years. Yeah, 30 years, 30 years of story yeah. and of history. Yeah. And, and I think this is very relevant because the place you can see that is, that is uh, regenerated. So I think it's a, a great example. And then cities should look like university. I think this is this is a, a, a great way to see it. And also other thing that I found there is that they are leading edge in business and biomimicry putting together. So this is very special because although sometimes you find a little bit of biomimicry here or regeneration there, but this specific example of a bioregion or, or, a, or a space that is owned by some people and these people are treating the land in a different way trying to set up governance systems, uh, like exchanges in between different types of people. So for example, bringing people from, let's say one culture and trying to build relationship in between them. I think this is beautiful. And biomimicry help us to, to talk more from a nature perspective and together with biology, I think this is why also I, I developed Seven Vortex because I, we needed something to talk in between us, right? Because I, I see the gap in between, we call it the North and the South, but it's not even the, the South. Right? It's, it's not even the center of the planet. We are, we are all in the North at, at that stage. Right. Uh, the knowledge is on the ground, right? People know their place and they know what they need to do there. They know what's important. They know the history and the essence, the, the true nature of their places. But they're still by, uh, giving them this kind of transparency and knowledge on the ground, you can evoke that love of place and the knowledge of place that they have when they're the ones that's going to live there, right, with their children and their children's children. So it's they can regenerate what's important to them um, through this transparency that gets rid of, you know, um, academic silos and political, like there's so much dominance relationships involved in this that you can't people can't hear each other a potential for an ecotone where we can combine what we know from the top um, through research with indigenous bottom-up experience of specific places rooted in the history and the of their families and what they what matters to them and making a living every day yeah yeah um, and so talking about biomimicry, I think it's very inspiring to, to know that the bacteria, they have this universal communication language. And I think we should get there at some point. And, and what I realize is that for us, it's visual. This language, it, it happens to be visual. So if, if we can structure, like it is very normal to see mind mapping, but we haven't been using mind mapping in the way that actually allows us to bridge in between different perspectives. And, and this is very important because it is not that they, they don't know, actually they know what to do, but it is more about us understanding what they are doing in a way that we can make sense out of it. Because putting just numbers and, and trying to, when we say, if you cannot measure, it doesn't exist. It's almost as, as a denial mentality of things that are there. So it's very difficult when you get there in the last 500 years or, or you don't know the place that's you right you don't know so now we are getting to realize for example in california that they know how to manage the forest and and they knew it but if we don't pay attention we are doing the same with every living thing yeah so it's a great opportunity to to make a difference and also i'm super proud to be with with bipros and yeah i'm happy i'm jumping generation but <laughs> You're OG, Hugo. You're <laughs> this is great. Like, I really enjoy it. And 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 with the three of you, I've been working and meeting and and being supported. So I just feel safe and and, and at home, you know, because uh, I think this is just a great place to be. I still don't know how or 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 when, but I'm pretty sure that diversity it is aligned in, in all of us because we need to to make it happen and we need to like level up these kind of examples and, and to give them yeah. voice. It's, it's the narrowest point of the Americas. It's only 35 miles wide there. Um, and it really did change the world, right? It changed the climate and 
And so, you know, as these hot spots rose up from the ocean and formed this isthmus, it cut off the ocean into two oceans and it connected the land. So there was diverse exchange. So it's really the ultimate like living bridge or ecotome that brings all these things together. So that's why I love that Hugo is so visual. I mean, the fact that he developed this uh, with no internet connection, just drawing it all. I mean, what kind of software company does that? <laughs> Which is why it's holistic. Um, and because I really think we need to bring in the art, the science, the, the, just the, the being out there, you know, experiencing living systems and the way that they are combining constantly, um, testing things constantly and providing these ecotones where we can come together and get these students coming in to geoversity. And some of them are in that 18 to 28 range, but we're also going to be working with architects and doctors and policymakers and different industries. So we have the real opportunity to show them like the way that innovation and resilient networks actually function. And it's so natural to us once they see it, um, it really does shift them. So to, this is the tinker toy of sustainability. So Hugo, would you like to treat us with some of your visual amazingness with the Seven Vortex? I think it's important to say that Seven Vortex is a biomimicry business, but I also am placing it as a regenerative business. As biomimicry and creating conditions conducive to life, it is very adaptable to these current times. This is what, what we have in university. We have nature. So when you design from this place and from this spirit, I think you design fully differently. The biomimic architecture behind Seven Vortex. So I'm the, the biomimicry uh, professional behind Seven Vortex. And I've been using the, the pillars, the principles, the process, the biology uh, to empower pioneers, organizations, and their communities, because I think we really need it. When, when you see what is happening now with social networks and this kind of stuff, I cannot believe that actually it is, it is uh, <laughs> happening like this. Yeah. So, and the same for artificial intelligence and graph database because they are not using their skills for something else than profit. And they don't really take care about more than profit. So what if we can use technology and business with a whole different punch, but, but driving this energy towards there. So I learned from the ecosystems and I learned from biology that these energy exchanges are very important. And this could be a game changer also for the, for the market. So there are some types of relationships. And if you see the market as an ecosystem, then that changes the game. Because in nature, you have plus, zero, and minus. And in computers, you have zeros and ones, so plus and zeros. So we are missing a whole dimension on, on, on trying to understand this. So if we can put together this kind of uh, thinking from isolated information to connected knowledge to ecosystemic wisdom, I think we can have a better and a different perspective more closer to nature. So right now, Seven Vortex has been, it's been used in, in 152 countries, 3,800 cities, uh, 300K page views, and we have a community a little bit bigger than 2,000 uh, users there. So what I'm, what I'm doing right now from this Seven Vortex with, with uh, diversity, it is really trying to build this, this point of reference of something that is working well and good and something that has been respectful with nature. So uh, trying to understand how actually the air is happening on the top of Panama and, and, and to see if there is there are particles, if the mother trees, they have, they have a, a special impact in the forest. So this is just a visual to, to, to express the breathing process of the planet. And I think if we take the pieces of, of, this, of these bioregions, we can have better information from there like touching into the indigenous knowledge, this is the, the, the brown spots is where indigenous peoples are and wilderness as well and coral reefs and blue carbon ecosystem and ancient and vulnerable. So I think we're exactly in this spot that you were saying that we need to make it work. If, if we make a success out of there, then we are gonna be on the other side. So I'm trying to put this um, very basic uh, structures, nature, uh, geometry in place. So to behave, to understand an ecosystem, to understand a change through the tree rings, uh, the hive and, and, and spheres. Uh, 
to, to better understand the, the bioregions in, in general terms. So what if we can see the impact? What if we can understand the metabolism and, and we can understand how energy materials uh, are being moved and how consumption and conversion, it is fully linked to the, to the organism and its ecosystem, including humans. So this is, this is part of the things that I'm building for, for um, age diversity. And we're building together this, this bridge to the financial world that are, are asking for CO2, but it is like the wrong side asking for, for, for the rules. And then you have here what is happening, right? Doesn't have access to the money. So how can we break this system? And, and this is part of the examples that we need to build already with the students or with the people that are, that are there. And this is what we are doing. So in terms of um, like main thinking is from machines to nature, from maximize to optimize, from linear to ecosystemic, and from competition to collaboration. And of course, we are using all the super organism um, approach to, to build uh, our teams, organization, and, and we are taking care of that as well. Geoversity uh, um, is, is in collaboration, it's a, a, a partner with Seven Vortex. So if you put here in the, in the open innovation source, in the open creative source, Geoversity, then you will see already this knowledge. So for example, when, when you have so much knowledge in Geoversity, but it's very difficult because all the information is siloed. So one of the first experiments that we did was to say, well, what kind of knowledge we have here? Who, who belongs to? Uh, what kind of format it has? And how this information could actually deliver a better story from the place? Because if we don't understand the place, even from a digital world, it is going to be hard to understand it uh, when we go there. So the, the ecosystem. It is very interesting because it is not just the school part and the projects, but it's also a preserve. So they have the Mamoni Valley Preserve and they are projects around the place and projects around the organization. So this is very unique and they are partnering and they are uh, walking the path and walking the talk with example. So it's another way of organizing the, the teams and using the same kind of uh, a structure, so the rings, the sphere, the hive, and this is how we are putting together the whole team. And it's a multidisciplinary collaboration. So I think this is a state of the art, and this is what what should be happening everywhere. Like in every team, should be all mixed with a lot of diversity. And so with these multiple different uh, perspectives, we are building something that is very robust and that is imitating the, the planet. So we're, with your leadership as well, Tamsin, we're heading through uh, uh, to regenerative metabolism. And this is what we've been learning. So you've been also teaching us and teaching the developers about nature. So it's very difficult to find this kind of uh, interaction because usually they are just behind the computer and they are not aware of what is happening in, in terms of nature. And thanks to this biology, they've been already mind blown and we're thinking about how to develop a bio network uh, for next stage, because we see all the harm that Facebook and, and other kind of social networks are doing to the, to, to the society. So what if we can implement biomimicry in a way that is positive and that could help to um, have a better metabolism, a regenerative metabolism, a healthy metabolism, but that takes a different mind because we need to understand the planet as a living thing and, and maybe not behaving exactly as the way that we do, but these interconnections and this, this mapping and this, this pulling together all the system, the, the holistic perspective could give us some insights to also acknowledge, understand, listen, indigenous people, because I think naturally we are more systemic. And then when we go to the school, we become really linear, but they do have this opportunity that they haven't gone to the school uh, sometimes. So they, they have all this understanding but they've been pushed to make it in lines. And this is what makes it difficult. But having this kind of visuals, it, it is helpful. It is attractive. My, my intention was to, to make something simple and attractive as, as a flower. Then I'm expecting to, to add uh, to the team. And of course, uh, Jane is a great user. Elisa has been helping me a lot. Uh, I, I meet you in, in different networks. So thank you for that. And this is just cross-pollination real time. 
So what we've got right now um, is this uh, mechanistic thinking in everything we do. The, the education these kids are getting, our organizations, everything, it's all designed for efficiency and linearity. And you can see you know, that it's eroding local potential, it's degenerating systems, we're losing biodiversity, um, everything's fragmented. The participants get to stay with indigenous villages there and they get to learn, you know, what are the plants they're using? What are the processes they're using to make their lives there? Um, and then we simultaneously, we have a storytelling program that is, we share stories from our own cultures, but we're also trying to uh, venture into developmental storytelling where we can tell stories that help us recast the future and the present in um, the way we're the, who we are, our essence from the past um, in a way that's really magical and it allows to transcend. I mean, it, if we're gonna collaborate across cultures like this, I mean, um, with, you know, indigenous cultures, you know, their science is unique from our science. Each one is unique for their science, you know, and it, it uh, if you're gonna have cross uh, fertilization of these radically different knowledge systems, you have to take it to the level of story and enchantment and um, something that we can, you know, share as, oh, we, we share those stars and we have different stories about them. And that links us to those. And usually those are mythical origin stories that convey our meaning and like who we are and where we're going in the world. So I think part of that then is that's going to be throughout the program. Um, and it's going to be about re mythologizing, like reimagining the enchantment each of us has to the places we live, right? Because if we're going to make this work, we all have to become indigenous again, but you mm -hmm. can't take other people's stories. Okay. So it comes to the moments that we spend with our own children and our own families and our own being in those real places, I think, and bringing that enchantment back. So to me, we have this really unusual opportunity an ecotone, you know, of really radically different ways of seeing the world that are all true. Um, and it's, I think that's the hope. So I think what we're doing is really exciting. I can't call it an initiation, but it's a, a process of opening you up to insights that allow you to have new capabilities, new insights. So the result that we hope to see through this kind of process we're gonna take them on which is really initiatory and transformative because they have to ride their bikes up to the top of the Cordillera. Uh, they uh, hike over the top, which is not easy. And then they raft down to the Caribbean and, and um, the university has campuses at all three places. And it's uh, pretty mind blowing. It's pretty intense. Um, and it results in, if you're lucky, complete transformation in the way you think um, from machine mind to living mind, life mind. See the cultures and the ecologies have to come together around place. And that's what you were talking about, Jane, those um, stories of place and the uh, essence, because that's where the potential comes from for a community. And if you do it right, and like where we're, if we can superimpose this kind of process onto that virtual Gaia, we can develop these Hot spots of energy and resources and collaboration that just grow from from um, generation to generation, and then form these bioregional networks spots. And before you know it, man, we've flipped the system, and it's a beautiful world. <laughs> That's the plan. Woohoo! Woohoo! I think something beautiful of, of what you are saying is that there is a purpose there. And, and the young people, they're lacking a purpose. They know that they need to do something, but news or the context seems to be more depressive than, than hopeful. Oh and, yeah, they're so lacking in hope. And, and, and it's sad because yeah, life, and, life and is resilient. I think as a, as a parent, I, I would really like my kids to go to this kind of program, although they are very small. They are very um, little yet, but of course, I learned this from my parents, 
and and we need to keep this hope alive and we need to keep making positive change to happen and i see that this is the the lacking of of hope that we see in the society so these kind of places these kind of programs are giving fresh air oxygen to the mind to the spirit to the community to the planet and maybe if we go positive enough and contagious enough then it's not just about biomimicry, but really about nature um, spraying around. And, and maybe these kids, they would like to go back to their cities and to say, we need more green, we need, we need more systems, we need more right. optimization instead of maximization. And, yeah. and that changes the whole narrative and that changes the game. What do you think? How do you feel about it? I, I was lucky enough to um, actually go to Panama and be a part of uh, one of the geodiversities um, sessions a couple of years ago. Um, so I'm super excited to be asked to be part of what they're doing going forward with Tamsin. Um, and you know what I've, what one of the things that I've been trying to understand, you know, I've worked in sustainability my entire career, um, biomimicry has, has just been the last few years, but it is that perspective change, right? It's like what we talk about biomimicry around the reconnection piece. And that, that part is so important for all of us to understand our place, reconnect to that place, respect that place and respect the people in that place. And so the work that I think I'd like to bring is, um, is the idea of bioregional regenerative development, right? And that we're really understanding where we are each of us around the world um, and that through that through that work we're we are creating a source book of tools and one of the feel, things i feel like you know has always kind of been a little bit harder for me to understand how to bring biomimicry to the world is that i don't always in for business and for like um you know uh community development you just need tools to help people understand that so what we're doing is creating a toolbox of various kinds of tools, including um, Ugo's seven vortex would be one of them to help people really understand where they are, how they can make this change themselves, because we know that we have the capacity. We have everything we need right now to, to, to make this switch. Um, but we all need to do it. It can't just be, it can't just be the, you know, the NGOs, it can't just be the governments, it's got to be each of us individually, because that's what's going to make the, that's what's going to make the change. And I think once we start seeing this perspective switch, I'm, I'm already seeing it a little bit, people are already kind of seeing a little bit. And I think once we start to really move that needle, I think we'll start seeing a lot more advancement um, around regenerative agriculture, for example, big landscape restoration, you know, looking at how to restore degraded grasslands, how to do small scale regenerative farming and buy from your neighbor. Like all these things are happening where I live in the Catskills already. Okay, so here are some very specific tools that you can use. You can take these back to your community and this is what you can use to organize yourselves, your community respecting the social economic side, the natural world, all community developers and activists to create that change. Oh, that's wonderful, Lisa. And also I'm thinking uh, one of the things that we're planning to do is um, we're working with city kids, city kids in New York. So um, we bring in kids from the city. Uh, we work with a lot of the indigenous um, reservations. Getting, they're getting to see this process and then we're supporting them to go back to their own neighborhoods and take that back. So exactly what you're saying, we're going to... Um, have a network of support for them back in those neighborhoods. And I sort of envision, you know, girls who code and uh, urban coding and things like that, um, that are very local, uh, but that come out of the essence of those places, because they're all going to be different. Yeah. But I think it's great if they, if these biocultural leaders can, can get those tools um, and go back to their communities. And then you also get that support of the network of other kids that are doing the same thing in their communities because it can get really local lonely to go back to your you remember when we take these biomimicry uh immersions you go back home and you're like oh my god just shoot me like i have yeah snuggle, uh -huh. snuggle pot no, is... bottom. <laughs> <laughs> i couldn't help it 
Okay, this is well, I I'm thinking about play. Um, and I'm thinking about, you know, how does nature learn? That's my question. And um, you know, immersive learning is how nature learns and through playing um, in place, you know, and that's that's tossing around different elements and creating something new, and testing your environment. And that's what I think um, Geoversity offers that opportunity for play, for coming to a place and then, you know, having to learn to adapt to that place and through that learning, creating um, the potential or, you know, optimising that potential for learning from their own places when they go back. So it's sort of a, a retraining of, you know, how, what it is to actually be human. Yeah, I was talking to somebody the other day that was really in, you know, in the sustainability field and they were saying that it's so disheartening and boring. It's boring them to tears because it's just these lists lists and lists and numbers and all and i'm like that's because we're doing sustainability like a machine you know mm -hmm. and, and you look at, if you read sand talk i mean they're basically you know working on those protocols for maintaining sustainable flow you know yeah. diversity autonomy connectivity adaptivity yeah. um and then as super organisms we also have shared purpose so to me if i can get this as like tinker toy in everyone's tool set um, yeah, it's just like, it's like walking into, you know, continuing with sustainability as we've done it as this set of measures, improving on bad practice. Um, it, it's like walking into the tar pits and you're, yeah. Slowly, <laughs> yeah. You know, you're just walking more slowly, but you're still going into the tar pits. Reducing, yeah. the, reducing the flow. Yeah. And it's still just not going to get to the reality it's just still keeping it the same it's not doing anything. yeah um and it's still it's kind of soul crushing you know it it, it, it there's no creativity in it we we also need to to mention is that university is a, a technological bacon for the future I would be a, a student for example and i would like to be in a very avant-garde uh, yes. institution this is where you want to be because it, it has mm -hmm. a the, the extremes and it has the ecotone of, of all these kind of different things. They are working with, with Silicon Valley, they are working with indigenous people, they are doing all at once. And I, it is very difficult to me to find projects so complete. So if you really want to learn how to make the difference, mm. I think university is a special place to try it. And we do have some visitors. Look at that. Oh, I believe that. We have 21 Jaguars. Tell, show us the, the, oh yeah, and we got Jane Goodall as a partner. She's been out there for five, five times. Um, and she's a real, a real uh, ally. <laughs> oh yeah, we're working up with IDEO on some uh, design. We've done the Avatar uh, video game was worked on there. Um, we're very tied in with that, with James Cameron and, and that. Uh, there's so much good stuff. Mm. It's pretty crazy. We kind of miss it. Come on. This I know. I got to come back there. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that's fabulous. So we uh, come on down to Geoversity and you'll see um, all these amazing so I have, I have one question because I haven't been there, but my sensation is that uh, for these COVID times, yes, it is a nice place to be. We have this competitive advantage of not having, uh, like Harvard, all the people stuck in a in, in an auditorium, just just one thousand people or groups of thousands of people, and this is just human size. Uh, um, and we come, we meet you at the airport. We take the uh, kids or anyone who comes to visit straight up to Mamani. Um, it's 12,000 hectares. It's uh, plenty of open space. So, uh, and it's designated as a governmental quarantine site. So um, you're, if there is a quarantine period, it's built in up there. Uh, the, we have a medic team. We're actually working with the NASA and the SEALs 
SEAL Team <laughs> That's it's it's overdone. It's overkill. <laughs> Safe. They've got cutting edge medical equipment. Panama is a very modern country. Yeah. And that's the other thing. So I've started this biomimicry oasis out in uh, Anza Borrego. And that's the, it's just, um, you know, you don't, you're not breathing on each other. <laughs> you relax. You don't yeah. feel any of that stress. You don't feel like the world's end. I, I can't wait to get everyone out there into yeah, my University like, West. As a parent, you want these places or as, as a person, you want to be in these kind of places. Yeah. Yeah, it's about it mimic, I love it. <laughs> yeah, we need all the optimism and energy we can get, I think, at this stage. Yeah. Okay, ready? One, two, three. We, we can't, can't wait, wait to see it. you at Geoversity. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, what I want still, my idea is for ha um, a new Zoom thing where we're in hexagons. Yeah, I like that. Can we do that? Oh, well, I'll talk to Hugo. <laughs> that would be better this for the revamp. Can you revamp Zoom for us? Yeah, after Facebook. For the I, hive love, I love that Facebook idea. The fungal book? Yeah, we're doing fungal book. What? Oh, nice. Uh, Fungal book, and then we'll do um, hexa zoom. Yes. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's, it's better so for the hive mind. That's right. Yeah, and this is why I want to do the the social network part because I think like working in in Slack or or in these groups, yeah, they are not designed to to take action. They are not designed to move forward. No. And you can feel it. So this is very yeah. frustrating because you cannot move. And you know that the people are there, but you yeah. cannot move. Biomimicry Ecoton is a talk, a talk show that um, we're doing in between Bipros. And we want to reach biomimicry pioneers all over the world. And Tamsin is going to be our first guest. It's, a, it's just a conversation in between, in, in between biomimics. And just to be a little bit aware of what we're doing uh, for the moment is one per month. And, and this one is going to happen on November the 12th. And keep tuned. We'll thank you, Hugo. Thank you. All of you, thank you so, so much for making the time, um, even though it's stupid o'clock for half of you. And uh, I well, can't wait to see for me. Friday. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Bye, thanks all. Bye. 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 Thank you. Love you all. Take care.